Turn, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 24. You know, it's uh, sometimes it can be embarrassing when you don't recognize somebody you think you ought to recognize. Can I confess to you one of the things I hate most is when I'm at a conference or some something and someone walks up to me and goes, hey, you remember me? Don't you hate that? The only thing a little worse than that is when they go, hey, you know my name? Uh, you know, just, just make me feel bad for not remembering you or knowing your name. And, uh, you know, I get it. I, in fact, when I introduce myself to somebody that I already sort of know, I say, I'm Herschel York. I, I don't ask them. I don't expect them to even look at me. And know, you know, if they knew me 40 years ago, I don't look like the same guy. So I try and tell them if I, I think they might not recognize me. Uh, Tanya and I, we were one time on a plane. Now, uh, we love getting upgrades. And on these long-haul flights, you know, you never, you never pay for first class. But because of I fly so much on Delta, I, I do get bumped up quite a bit. And this was on a long-haul flight. We'd come from Hawaii to L.A. and then very quickly caught the plane from L.A. to Atlanta. And uh, that, that's like it. I don't know, five or six o'clock in the morning, a red eye flight out of LA, fly all the way to Atlanta and everybody getting on it sleepy. And we had gotten the upgrade. They, they had two seats open in first class on this wide body jet, but they weren't together. They said, you know, we can put you both up there, but you're not together. I said, uh, great, great. Now I know how the game is played. I do this a lot. So what you do is you take those two seats and people who fly up in first class will switch with you They'll switch an aisle for an aisle or a window for a window. They don't like to change anyone. So I was, Tanya was in a window seat. I was in an aisle seat. And I know if you just go ahead and get on, just get on the plane uh, early. If you can be one of the first ones on the plane and then just go ahead and sit in the seat beside her. That's my plan. And whenever the person gets on that is in my seat, I, I've done this many times. Here's the way it goes. They look at their ticket, they look at you, they look back at their ticket, they look back at you, and then they go, you're in my seat. Now, it's at that point that I go, hey, I'm, this is my wife, and we'd really love to sit together. If you don't mind, I'm up in 3B, it's an aisle seat. If you would just swap with me and sit there in 3B. Almost always they'll do it. Very few people are big enough jerks that they won't do that. But this guy gets on, and I see him. He's getting on. He's really sleepy. He's got a guitar case and a dog. And he gets to me, puts down the guitar case. He looks at his ticket. He looks at me. He looks back at his ticket. He looks back at me. I know this is my guy. He says, you're in my seat. I said, hey, this is my wife. And, uh, you know, I would love to get to be on a flight beside her, you know, to, three and a half hour flight. If you don't mind, I'd love to sit here. And my seat's 3B. It's an aisle seat too. You won't have to climb in over anybody. Would you mind swapping? He goes, okay, I'll do that. And he goes up. Now I see when he sits down, the person he's sitting by is not that thrilled with a guy with a guitar case and a dog is sitting by him. But as he walks away from me, I'm grateful that he wasn't a jerk, even though he hesitated a little bit. And then I think, you know, guy looks familiar to me. Uh, that's Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec. Uh, Nick Offerman, the actor, husband of Megan Mullally. And I was so grateful that, uh, you know, he gave up his seat. But then it occurred to me, Tanya probably would rather have sat by him on that flight. <laughs> but uh, when we, when we landed in Atlanta and we all get up, you know, and you're sort of waiting to get off the plane, we did, I thanked him profusely and he talked to us a little bit. He was very, very kind, but you know, uh, I felt sort of awkward that I hadn't recognized him. That, that can't be nearly as bad as the way these disciples on the road to Emmaus feel because the person they don't recognize is Jesus, their teacher and Lord. Now, there's something about Jesus' resurrection body that we know is different because nobody immediately recognizes him. It takes all of them time to recognize him, and it's almost always in some action, either something he does or says, 
theologians put it like this, there's continuity in his body, but it's not exactly the same. In other words, it's the same body that he had before he was crucified, but somehow the molecules are re-knit and he's in a glorified body. It's a body that's no longer subject to physics. We see He can do things like appear and disappear, pass through a wall, yet he's still very human. He eats a sandwich. He eats food with them and illustrates that he's clearly got a physical body. But these guys on the road to Emmaus don't know it. Now, you recall last week when we looked at that, the opening verses there in chapter 24, we see the scene of the women going to the tomb and finding Jesus not there. And when they go back and tell the 11 and the others, the reaction that they get is, this seems like an idle tale. What kind of a story is this? But Peter gets up and he runs to the tomb, finding it empty, just like the women said. He goes back home in wonder and amazement. He he doesn't get it. Now, Luke shifts the scene and he's the only one of the four gospels that tells us this story. This is what is called his special material and what a story it's one of my all-time favorite passages in all the bible let's pick up the story in verse 13 so this is sometime on sunday morning that the very morning jesus has risen that very day two of them were going to a village named emmaus about seven miles from jerusalem and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to him, to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they'd seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, fools, literally it's oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now Luke is writing a remarkable narrative here, and he's telling us the most extraordinary miracle in the history of the world. He's telling us the thing that irrevocably, undeniably, declares to us the reality that God is active in the world and that he has acted to redeem a people. The resurrection of Jesus is that central event. And because it's unique, because it's not like anything else in all of our experience, Luke is continuing to confront our skepticism. He's wanting us to know that we can most certainly believe these things about Jesus. That's really been the theme of our entire study of Luke. And And here, as he tells us about the resurrection, this resurrection account continues to confront our skepticism, even on the road to Emmaus. He's telling us the story in such a way that 
he wants us to know uh, other people struggled with this too. <laughs> Even his own disciples didn't get it at first. You're, you're not alone in your skepticism. Uh, you're not unique because you really might struggle to comprehend or even accept the resurrection but let me lay out the case for you and he tells us about these disciples only one of them is named Cleopas the other remains anonymous to us his name is lost to history but they're walking along remember it's the day after the Sabbath after Passover and so this is the day when many of the pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover are now going home. So the roads out of Jerusalem would be clogged with people. So I, I know we see the lovely paintings and pictures of the road to Emmaus, and it's always Jesus alone with these two guys. It was almost certainly not like that. There would have been a lot of people. But you know how people do. People bunch up. They walk together. They talk. Other crowds, you know, other groups will walk faster than them and pass them. They'll walk faster than other groups and pass them. That's going on, no doubt, on this road. And it, Luke says that as they're walking along, uh, Jesus draws near to them. He, he, he just somehow he inserts himself into their little group of two and makes it three. Now, look at Luke's careful description of these guys and what they're feeling. First of all, they're overwhelmed by the events. Uh, verse 14 tells us that this is what they're talking about. And how else could you? I mean, if, if you had such a tragic event, if someone that you loved dearly had been killed just two days earlier, especially as horrifically, as painfully as Jesus, and if you had witnessed that, no doubt these disciples had stood back perhaps maybe somewhere around the garden gate so they're not too close to the, the scene of the crucifixion. But how could Jesus' disciples stay completely away? How could they know that their Lord is being crucified outside the city walls and not at least go look to see his agony for themselves? And perhaps these guys had witnessed even at least a portion of Jesus' suffering on the cross and now all these events that had transpired early that morning, they don't know how to process it. I think overwhelmed is the word. They're overwhelmed in so many ways. They're overwhelmed with grief and sorrow and the, the sadness of separation. And now here are all these questions being raised. I mean, where's his body? Who would take his body? What, what on earth has happened? And Luke tells us this, that they are not, their eyes are not yet opened to who he is. You see, get that? They are blinded by their fallen minds to the identity of Jesus. Now, this is uh, not unique, really, because all of us suffer from what theologians call the post-lapsarian noetic effects simply means after the fall, our thinking got messed up. I, don't, I know I can prove this to married people. Married people know what it is when the two of you have a disagreement about, oh, it could be anything. It can be about something that happened. It can be about the tone of voice one of you had. It can be about the way you deal with your kids. But both of you are absolutely convinced you're right. And in your mind, maybe, maybe you're not so crass as to say it, but you're thinking, you know, if she would just admit I'm right and apologize for her wrong attitude here, we could move on. But while you're thinking that thought, guess what she's thinking? She's thinking, I can't believe he just can't admit when he's wrong. He just has to be right. And both of you are absolutely convinced you're right and that the other one should just give in. How do you explain that? And I'm pretty sure that didn't happen just once or twice in your marriage. It, I bet there have been stretches in your marriage. It was a daily event. Uh, hopefully we all sort of grow out of it a little bit. But it happens every now and then that Tanya, her, the effects of the fall are greater on her <laughs> than I wish they were. 
you know the point. We don't think clearly because sin clouds our thinking. We, we look at the world around us, our interpretation of the world around us. Let's, let's look at the current election uh, in the United States. I'm seeing Christians post things, and basically here's the way it goes. If anybody doesn't look at this exactly the way that I'm looking at it, they're just not even a real Christian. Have you seen anything like that? Have you heard anything like that? It's just like, and I'm seeing people all over the political spectrum. It's like, I just don't know how a true Christian can vote for X. Fill in the blank. And they just have absolutely no comprehension of how anybody could think differently than they are. But here's the problem. We're all affected by sin. Even sanctification is a progressive process. We're, none of us have reached total perfect sanctification I know some of us like to think we have, but, but we haven't. And even as a believer, our minds are still clouded by sin. And these guys, it says that their eyes were not yet opened. Here's Jesus, their Lord, their master, their creator, walking with them. But they're blinded by their fallen minds. They don't yet see it. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? Now, I love that because what, J Jesus is toying with them a little bit. You know, he, he's playing with them. What are you guys talking about? He knows very well what they're talking about. And notice when he asks the question, the re, the, what Luke says is that they just stop and they're sad. Before they answer, they just stop. They don't, how, do you, how do you tell this story? Where do you start? Where does this begin? It says they stopped and they're, they're saddened. What are they saddened by? By the loss of their teacher, Jesus. But look, is that loss really a loss? No, they're saddened by a loss that's really a gain. Because if Jesus does not die on the cross, they can't be saved. If Jesus does not give his life for God's wrath to be poured out on sin, there's no way they can go to heaven. So I understand that they're sad. I understand that they feel a loss, but they don't yet even get that this is a gain. Is that not frequently the way it is in our own minds? How many times has God allowed a hardship in your life only to later turn it into something that was precisely what you needed? Life is lived forward, but it's usually only understood looking backward, isn't it? And here's a, a gain. Jesus has died and was buried and rose again. But to them, it's just the sadness of a loss. They don't get it. And so they say, are, really, are, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that doesn't know these things? You see here, because they're walking on the road out of town, they assume Jesus, like them, is a visitor to Jerusalem, has gone there for the Passover. But this thing has happened, and it's been talked about so much. It's made the news so much. That even before Facebook and Twitter, the word got around, and they're like, how, how can you be in Jerusalem and not know what happened? Are you the only guy in Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened? And they begin to describe to him the events of the previous three days concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Look how they describe him. A man... A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. <clears throat> now, we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Now, look how carefully Luke relates their description of Jesus. They they value Jesus clearly. They don't venerate Jesus, right? They see him as a man and a prophet, and they had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. What does that suggest? Their hopes were dashed. They don't still, I put that in the past tense. We had hoped. They don't say we're hoping. They're valuing Jesus without venerating him. They're, they're wishing for Jesus, but they don't, they're not worshiping Jesus. They don't say, Jesus is God in the flesh. He's God's agent who 
came to bring salvation. We don't understand it yet, but we really know he's the one. They're hoping for Jesus, but they're not hoping in Jesus. And there is all the difference in the world in those two things. So often we use the word hope like the word wish, right? I hope today when we go out to eat after church, that there's not a crowd and we have to, I hate to wait to eat. I'm hoping we don't have to wait to get a table today. Uh, that's a wish, isn't it? I have no control over that. I'm not trusting in that. That may or may not happen. I'm just, I'm expressing my desire. That's all that kind of hope is. <clears throat> the biblical kind of hope is very different. It's trust. It's confidence. It's assurance. It's placing my trust in Jesus. I'm not hoping that Jesus might return. My hope is in the return of Christ. You see the difference? I'm not hoping Jesus saves me. My hope is in his salvation. Very, very different. I'm not wishing for it. I've got it. I've placed my trust, my confidence, my future in it. That's the biblical hope. It's an assurance that God is going to keep his word. They've got hope for they don't have hope in Jesus. Even though they thought him a prophet. But can prophets save you? No, they warn. They tell. They point. But they can't save. Not any old ordinary prophet. What they're not getting is what Jesus testified about himself. Remember, Jesus told the parable of the wicked tenants. You remember that back, I think, in chapter twenty. And the, the, the owner of the vineyard left some people. He allowed these tenants to operate his vineyard. And when he sent messengers to them to bring him a portion of their harvest, a return on his vineyard, they took his messengers. And what did they do? They, they cast them out. They abused them. They, they beat them. And so finally, the owner of the vineyard says, I'll send my beloved son. Remember this story Jesus told? And when the son came, they said, oh, here comes the heir. Let's kill him. Jesus concluded the parable by saying, oh, the vineyard's going to be taken from those tenants. It's going to be given to another. Remember the, the response of those who heard Jesus teach us in the temple was surely not. Now in that parable, what does Jesus call himself? Is he a messenger? Is he a prophet or is he the son? Now, Jesus has over and over and over again told them who he is. He's told them what's going to happen. And these guys don't get it. Notice their, their description. Oh, he is a man, a prophet. They thought him mighty in deed and word before God, but they did not think him God, who's mighty in word and deed. They wanted redemption. Oh, we hoped he was the redeemer of Israel. But they wanted redemption without resurrection. And that was never God's plan. God's plan was always to allow Jesus to suffer and die. This has been the testimony of all of the Old Testament. What is the theme of the Old Testament? It's Jesus. It's that Jesus is going to come and he's going to redeem he's the he, sinners. He's going to reverse the curse from the garden. He's going to, he is going to redeem Israel, but it's much bigger than that because he came to redeem the world. And yet at the same time, it's much more personal than that because he came to redeem me. Now, on one level, Jesus is being playful with them, isn't he? The way he asks the question, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> he knows full well what they're talking about. And, well, tell me more about that. All right, are you the only one who doesn't know? If you've ever read <clears throat> C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you, you understand this scene somewhat because... In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis has the, the, the Christ character, if you will, is Aslan, the lion. And when, the, when Aslan 
dies on the stone table, which is Lewis's tip of his hat to the law. It's the law under which Jesus is put to death because sinners have violated the law. And Aslan willingly dies in place of someone else who deserves to die. And Lucy and Susan, the two, two of the children who are the main characters in the story, they, they see Aslan willingly lie down there on that stone table. And they see him bound and they look away in terror as he is put to death by the witch. But when Aslan comes back to life, when he gets up, the, the word, the verb that Lewis uses is he frolics with Lucy and Susan. I like that. He's playful. They, they dance about. They, they run into the woods. There's this light-hearted, after the, the despair, the despondency, as Aslan had gone to the stone table in order to give his life, there's this joy, this playfulness. And I think he's got it exactly right. That's what you see in Jesus here. He's playing with them. Oh, yeah? What happened? Tell me more about that. And they tell him, and they clearly show they've got a deficient Christology. We had hoped he was the Redeemer of Israel. And what's Jesus' very gracious, tender response? You fools! What? Now that's startling coming from the mouth of the one who tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, call no one a fool. That's something reserved for God only. In fact, it made me think, who do, whom does God call a fool? Well, Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. God calls someone who doesn't even believe in him a fool. Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, one of my favorite texts to give my students at Southern Seminary, two verses that seem to contradict each other. They're about a fool. Verse 4 of Proverbs 26, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. But the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, that there's an indication that the book of Proverbs should be read as exactly that, Proverbs, not promises. And I think what Solomon is telling us there is that you need the Holy Spirit to know when to apply which principle. We all have need a dependence on the Holy Spirit, but clearly the book of Proverbs tells us some, there are those who are fools. Jesus calls the Pharisees in Matthew 23, in that chapter of woes against the Pharisees, he calls the Pharisees fools. He says, woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, well, that's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, Jesus said, which is greater, the gold of the temple or the temple that has made the gold sacred? He just showed them the kind of sophistry and pedantry that they engage in in order to lay more and more burdens on people. And though they know the Bible, they're fools because they use it incorrectly. Who does Jesus call a fool? Remember the story told back in Luke 12? In fact, the parable bears his name, the rich fool, the guy who had so much. He said, oh man, I've got so much. I'm going to build more barns to put it in. I'm going to say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. And what does Jesus say? Thou fool, tonight your soul shall be required of you. A fool is someone who puts their trust in things rather than God. But here Jesus calls his own disciples. These aren't Pharisees trying to lay burdens on people. These aren't the kind of fool that the book of Proverbs speaks about, these, this, these are not the fool that is trusting in stuff. But when Jesus calls them a fool, it's because, look what he says, your, your heart is slow to believe all 
that the prophets have said. You're only believing a part of it. And if you don't accept all of it, you're a fool. Now compare this. I think Luke's given us a comparison in chapter 24 where these guys that are disciples who've walked with Jesus and heard his teaching, and yet they still don't embrace it, contrast them with the thief on the cross in chapter 23 who listens to Jesus cry out from the Psalms, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He hears Jesus pray, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And somehow in his mind, he puts it all together. When his companion uh, begins to rail on Jesus, he rebukes him. He said, don't you fear God? Seeing that you're under the same condemnation of death as he, and we indeed justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he looks at him and he just says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief on the cross got it, and he accepted it, and he knew that Jesus was a king who was going to rule on a throne, and here his own two disciples walking along going, we, we, don't, we don't understand this. Jesus said, you're, you're fools. I fear that a lot of contemporary Christianity are really no better than these Emmaus disciples walking along the road that, oh, we engage in sorrow around Easter time to think about Jesus dying, but we think of Jesus just dying to show us what love sacrifices and to set a moral example for us. And, you know, that Jesus is popular. It's always okay to talk about Jesus who cares for the poor and who heals the sick and it goes around doing good deeds and teaching things so long as we don't really talk in detail about what he taught and what he said about himself. Philip Gully is a, a Quaker pastor. He wrote a book called Unlearning God. I, I see him quoted all the time by liberal Christians. Let me read to you a passage from his book, Unlearning God. I want you to listen how deceptive it is, how lovely it sounds, how inviting it is to get people to think that you really don't have to accept the Jesus of the Bible. You, you can dethrone him. You can rid him of his divinity and all the trappings of that and just see him as a wonderful, in fact, the word he uses is lovely example. And that's all you need. Listen, I quote, if Jesus was God, his compassion, insight, and healing presence flowed out of his divine status and were therefore not real possibilities for us, even though the church has told us to be like him. But if Jesus was fully human and only that and nothing more, then his life, his mercy, wisdom, and grace become real possibilities for us too. I am at peace with Jesus, fully appreciative of his courage and grace, moved by his compassion and stirred by his example. For me, it was not necessary to seat Jesus at the right hand of God to defend his perfection or to follow a star and sing his praises. It is enough to simply hold his lovely life before me and aspire to such loveliness myself. I need not venerate him as my ruler, for I have welcomed him as a friend, and he has done the same for me. End quote. Beloved, I, I say it as kindly and graciously but as honestly as I can, Philip Gully is a fool. And I, I, I say this to you because at some point in the onslaught that Christianity is facing now, especially here in the West, you are going to be tempted to embrace that Jesus. You are going to be tempted to walk the road of Emmaus, not with Jesus, but with these ignorant disciples and saying, well, he was a good man and a prophet and mighty in word and deed before God, but it wasn't God. You don't really have to believe that 
He rose from the dead. Because to embrace this Jesus is to embrace everything that his word teaches about sex, gender, marriage, the view of the Bible, ethics, politics. You're going to find yourself increasingly at odds with the world. And you're going to be tempted to say, okay, I can, I can accept the Jesus who is fully human but not really God more easily than I can buy into this business about him rising from the dead. And Jesus says, you're a fool and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. And he says, wasn't it necessary? Look at that word. Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now, notice that Jesus calls the suffering of the Christ, first of all, it's the necessary result of what the prophets have spoken. In other words, all of the Old Testament has pointed forward to this fact that the Messiah has to suffer. I mean, the very first promise of the Messiah in Genesis 3 is that there will be a seed of the woman who will come and crush the head of the serpent. But what will happen to the seed of the woman? The serpent will bruise his heel, suffering. The very first instance of the gospel, what we call the Proto-Evangelion in Genesis 3, talks about the suffering of the Messiah. And throughout all of the Old Testament, you see this, that this is the necessary pray, this, is the, this is the necessary result of what the prophets have spoken. Look back at chapter 13, where Jesus himself, the very first time he, he laments Jerusalem, it's before he gets there, verse 33, he says, nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered you, your children together like a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus has said all along that he has to go to Jerusalem because it's there in Jerusalem that prophets die. This has always been God's way. And now he is the great prophet like unto Moses. And he's going to Jerusalem to suffer. He has to suffer. This is what the prophets have spoken and suffered. And Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the prophets have done and said. Therefore, he has to suffer. But it's also the necessary prelude to Christ entering his glory. And this is what these disciples don't understand. It's, it's what so much of Christ, modern Christianity doesn't understand, that you can't have a coronation without a crucifixion. There, there cannot be an exaltation without a humiliation. There, there, there can't be a Christ entering into his glory until he has first entered into a tomb. These things are connected. We want the glory without suffering. But even for us, what does Paul say is God's great purpose for us? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. How? Being made like him in his death. The fellowship of his suffering. The prophets suffered. Jesus, as the final and great prophet, suffered. But you know what? Paul said, I too fill up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. He's not talking about redemption, but he's saying that there's a suffering that you and I do, a suffering uh, that is worth getting the gospel out there. It's going to cost us to tell others about Jesus. It's going to cost us to follow Jesus. He's left suffering for us to do as well before we enter our glory. 
See, while the disciples focused on events, Jesus focused on the scriptures. They're talking about all the stuff. They're looking around at what's happened, and this is where their conversation is. In fact, notice the verbs. Do you notice? Luke gives them a lot of different verbs. They talked in verse 14. They discussed in verse 15. They held conversation in verse 17. What did Jesus do? Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted all scripture. And I love that verb. He interpreted. If you watched the Senate hearings over the the confirmation hearings at all this week, you've heard a discussion about hermeneutics. How do you interpret the Constitution? Amy Coney Barrett says that in line with uh, Antonin Scalia, she is what's called an originalist or a textualist. She believes that you've got to interpret it based on what it actually says. Now, to me, what's remarkable is that that is remarkable at all. Because I, I read an article this week that Lawrence Tribe, uh, a, a liberal professor, wrote about it in which he, said, he talked about how ridiculous it was that we should interpret the Constitution based on its original intent. Now, here's what's funny. He, he wants everybody to read his article based on what he meant. And he wrote an article telling us what he meant to tell us that you can't know what the Constitution means and that every generation can read into it what they want it to mean. Well, you don't want your pharmacist doing that with your prescriptions. You don't want your bank doing that with your mortgage. We want words to have meaning. We want to be able to read it. And I want you to see that this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's opening the Old Testament to them verbally as they walk along these seven miles. And he's saying, don't you remember And he will tell them a passage, and then he will interpret it how that passage points to Christ. Hey, don't you remember in the book of Genesis, in the very first book, that when Adam and Eve sin, and God promises there's going to be a seed of the woman, don't you recall that the serpent will bruise his heel? See, the Christ has to suffer. Don't you recall in Psalm 2? When the question is asked, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine vain things. Why do the kings of the earth plot together? What are they plotting to do? They're they're plotting to extinguish God's anointed. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 53? He was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. If I could step into a time machine and transport myself to any place in history, this would be it. To walk the road to Emmaus, to hear Jesus interpreting the scripture, showing in Genesis how he's the promised seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the great high priest and the blood of the lamb who's sprinkled on the mercy seat, which he also is the place of atonement. In, in, in Numbers, he's the star who comes out of Jacob. In Deuteronomy, he's the faithful God who keeps covenant with his people. In Isaiah, the suffering servant. In the Psalms, he's the one who is forsaken by God, who becomes a worm and not a man while surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. Don't you see the Christ had to suffer and the one against whom the nations rage and the people plot in vain has come not just to redeem Israel but to redeem you and I I think their problem more than not understanding the scriptures was that they did not see their own sinfulness they They're thinking about him redeeming Israel in the abstract. They're sort of probably thinking about that means he's getting rid of Rome. What they're not getting is that they're sinners. If you come to see your own sinfulness, then you know you need a redeemer. That's what they don't understand. But Jesus walking that long road to Emmaus with them, for those seven miles 
tells them the Old Testament promises a redeemer. And the empty tomb delivers one. That's our hope. It's our only 